Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to treat today kind of like a buffet. Does anybody remember what a buffet is? Wave at me. Remember the good old days? You could just go up to that soft serve ice cream, forget the cone, pour it in a cup and a bowl. Come on, somebody. Dazzle the chocolate, go back and eat none of it. That was awesome. So today's going to be a little bit like a buffet. I got a lot of stuff to talk to you about. And today, I'm going to, I titled the sermon, Don't Be Like That. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be like that. Tell them, don't be like that. Now, there are so many things that we can learn from the Bible. And, and, and one of the main themes is you need to learn from others' mistakes. Raise your hand if you're either the youngest or the middle child in here. Go ahead, raise your hand. Look at all you beautiful people. Yes. Go ahead and raise your hand if you're the oldest. We learned from your mistakes. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. So I knew <laughs> I knew if it got my brother in trouble, it would get me in trouble. Huh, yeah. But how many of you were just too stubborn? You had to learn the hard way anyway. There you go. Okay. So we want to learn from others' mistakes, right? So don't be like that. My mom and daddy told me, don't be like that. And they'd point to something. And okay, here we go. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to read out of the passage translation. You might have to pull up your phone to get that on your app. I love this. I've been doing my whole study through this one translation. It says, so search your hearts every day. Not just today and tomorrow, but every day, my brothers and sisters. And make sure that none of you, look at this, has evil or what? Look at that. He literally married together evil and unbelief. He said, make sure none of these are, represent, or, 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 are representative in your heart. Make sure they're not there. He goes on to say that it's hiding within you, for it will lead you astray and make you unresponsive to the living God. Evil and unbelief will make it to where you cannot respond to God's voice. It's interesting. Watch this. This is the time to encourage each other to never be stubborn or hardened by sin's what? Deceitfulness. It says this will literally harden your hearts. Clogged arteries here, okay? For we are mingled with the Messiah if we will continue unshaken in this confidence. Assurance from the beginning until the end. Now watch this. This is powerful. This is what I'm going to be preaching on here. The same people who were delivered from bondage and brought out of Egypt. These same people, right, that were led out by Moses out of Egypt were the ones who heard and still what? Rebelled. Rebelled. They grieved God for 40 years by sitting in their what? Did you know there's a difference between doubt and unbelief? There's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Unbelief was a stubbornness to not move forward when God has asked you to. Doubt is always doubt is always present when faith is active. You'll meet plenty of people who doubt and are still walking forward. I'll preach on that later. Okay. They grieved God for 40 years by sinning in their unbelief. They dropped dead in the desert. That was going to be my sermon title until I changed it. I was going to put drop dead in the desert. But I figured nobody would tune in. Okay, so. So God swore an oath that they would never enter in to his calming place of rest, all because they disobeyed him. It is clear that they cannot enter into their inheritance because they wrapped their hearts up in what? Unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity. We thank you for your word. Lord, it's my prayer that as you speak to me, speak through me for the blessing and benefit of your people. In Jesus' name we all said. Can we give the worship team a hand, please, and Jerome, thank you so much. <sighs> Jerome, I just want you to know that if you and I were in the desert, you'd die first, brother, because you're so skinny. So this is all on purpose. <laughs> I couldn't resist. He literally told me, I'm eating whatever I can. Oh, my gosh, Jerome. I've known, I've known Jerome and his family since, gosh, we've known each other since, what, 06, 05? So, man, and I've put on all the weight, and this has been embarrassing. When I thought about this passage of text and I was thinking about this, um, I actually did a little bit of studying because he makes reference and he makes notion to Moses bringing them out of Egypt and into the desert, right? And so we just come off uh, Passover, we come off Easter, and many of us went home and watched the Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments. And, you know, I, I watch that every year. I fall asleep through halfway of it every year, but it's okay. It's, it's getting in still, right? It's getting in. And so I've come to the realization that there was a lot of things that actually happened in the desert. 
there were a lot of things that transpired and took place. And it's really interesting because when you go to research things that happened in the desert, you're going to come up with 11. There were 11 points of rebellion or unbelief or hardening of hearts in the desert. It's really something kind of to be studied. It's, it's pretty amazing because I believe it's a blueprint for all the issues of our hearts. Right, all the issues of our hearts. And so I don't got time to go through all 11, but I just want to pull up on the board, and I'm going to go ahead and just kind of show you where they're at in Scripture, okay? I'm going to show you where they're at in Scripture. And uh, you can go home and read about it, but here's a few things they did in the wilderness. One of the first things they did is they built a calf, and you can read about that in the book of Exodus uh, chapter 32. Moses goes up on top of the mountain, and he's up there so long they get impatient, and when they get impatient, let me tell you something, when you get impatient, it'll lead you to sin. And so all of a sudden they said, hey, we think Moses died. They literally said, we think God consumed Moses. He's never to return. He's abandoned us. And all of a sudden, because of the fear of abandonment, they told Aaron, build us a God. And so they take off all their jewelry and they build a calf. Out of all the gods you could build, you build a cow. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's how I would do it. Carne asada all day, every day. And so all of a sudden... They build this calf and they begin to worship it. And it just goes to show you, beware of the idols in your heart. Beware of the idols in your heart. And so anytime we begin to get impatient or we begin to have unbelief and we begin to allow this doubt and unbelief and this rebellion and this heart of heart, we go chasing idols. Now, the, the, the part that concerns me is everybody, listen, everybody chases an idol. Why? Because your heart is an idol-producing factory. See, one man's idols might be shoes, the next man might be his car, the next person might be their house, the next person might be their family. The definition of idol is anything that's above God. Your career can be an idol. Your spouse can be an idol. Your kids can be an idol. You yourself can be an idol. You worship you and you alone. So we got to be careful. I think the great theologians, TLC, said, don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> Y'all singing the rest on the streams and the rivers. That you used to. Okay. No, but what's the whole point? You got to be careful. You ever heard that expression, the heart wants what the heart wants? That's a bad expression. That's a bad expression. We need to understand that at the base of who we are, when unbelief comes in and evil comes in, what did the Bible say? It leads you astray. And here's why. You were created to worship. You were created to worship. And if we don't put God first, we will put something else. Here it is. Idols cannot be removed. They must be replaced. Got to be replaced. Does that make sense? Okay, so they built the calf, and all of a sudden, here they are, right? Here's another thing they did. They rebelled against Moses. They rebelled against him. Against him. Korah came in, and he got a group of other people together, and they said, hey, listen, this Moses guy thinks he's better than us. Literally, that's what they said. He thinks he's better than us, holier than us. Why does he get to go up to the mountain of God, and we don't? So he conspired with a group of people, and he said, we're going to put Moses on blast. We're going to put him on Twitter, and we're going to talk all about him, and we're going to get people to cancel him out. And so Aaron gets up with Moses and he goes, hold on, hold on, let's see, let's let God be the judge of this. So he said, you guys who are against Moses on one side and the others of you on the, uh, you know, uh, who are with Moses on the other. And the Bible says that you had to go with your whole family. So Korah and his kids and his wife and everybody had to go on this side because they were against Moses. And then Moses gets up and he says, hey, let God decide today who's right and who's wrong. And the Bible says the earth opened up and swallowed everybody, including their families. That's when you got to be mad at who your mama and daddy is right there. On their way down, the Bible says that the earth swallowed them to the land of the dead. Like it's all descriptive. Just getting that deep raspy voice, in the land of the dead. Right? Like, ah! And the Bible says it covered them back up. Like you died whole. Like living whole. Like as you're falling down, the earth is swallowing you. It's like, that's a Lord of the Rings episode or something. That's bad. And what do we learn from this? Uh, be honorable when it comes to leadership. Don't go stirring the pot and gossiping. Here's a fancy thought. If you're not happy, move on. Right? I mean, is that, right? That's what, I, that's what I tell my kids when they don't like the restaurant. We just won't eat here again. There you go. It's that simple. Right? But what people like to do is they like to work themselves up, right? I tell people all the time, if you can't get on with the vision here, it's okay. There's plenty of churches. Just keep driving down Palm, 
and you'll find more. And if you go down Hernan, Alluvial, and Knees, it's Church Row. I mean, you'll find a ton of them, right? So I tell people that all the time, it's okay. It's okay. We realize we're a certain type of flavor, and we're cool with that. But that's why I try to tell people all the time, it's okay to move on, right? But once you start sowing discord amongst the brethren, you actually bring that back on yourself. Because the Bible says rebellion is as a sin as witchcraft. So all of a sudden you have that open door into your house and you wonder why your kids are rebelling. You wonder why your dog rebels. Your cat don't even come home. Okay. They also says they, they, they complained about provisions. They were walking through the desert. They said they were thirsty. God gives them water. Then they said they were hungry because they ran out of the food they brought out of Egypt. So God literally, literally rained down manna. They looked like coriander seeds. They were about this big. I mean, they were even smaller than that. They were about that big. Go to the store, look up coriander seeds. And what they would do is they, you know, mush them together, mush them together, and they, would, and they would literally make like pita bread every day, and they called it angel food. So what was crazy is they got tired of eating from God's provisions, so they said, we want quail. So the Bible says God literally blew in an east wind, and all the quail they could ever want landed at their doorstep. They ate so much quail that, that people died with meat hanging out of their mouth. Then they said, God, we're sick of quail. Hold on. First you were sick of water. Now you're sick of bread. Now you're sick of quail. Wouldn't it just be crazy if God said, I'm sick of you? <laughs> he didn't say that. I said, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and, and what happens? We've come to realize that a lot of times we're not satisfied. We're not content. So we keep going after one thing to the next thing to the next thing. How about this? You ready for this? Stop complaining about the job you have and start thanking God you got a job. Stop complaining to God about the car you have and just be thankful you ain't Joaquin. Oh, there you go. You like that one, huh? You like that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there was once an old proverb that said, I was, I, I was mad that I had uh, shoes that were too small for my feet until I saw a man who had no feet. Got that one out, see? So why? We need to learn that there's a purpose in the plan. You need to be thankful for what you have. You know, there's an old Jewish idiom, before you think, you need to thank. So the moment you get up, it's, thank you, God, I'm breathing. Did you know, can I go one step further? Can I go one step further? Don't laugh. This is actually honest, honest to God's truth, I promise you. Do you know that at their first at their first bodily function movement, whether it's pee or poo, they thank God first thing in the morning? It's literally a prayer. Thank you, God, that everything is still working. Y'all think I'm kidding. Someone's going to Google that later and go, he was right. There's actually a prayer of blessing for that. Hey, when you're backed up, you'll be praying that blessing. Okay. So it's the truth. It's the prayer. First, it's the first thing. You, you see, y'all think I'm lying. See, I can't believe it. You're going to Google, and I'll, and I'll receive your apology when it's over. So they start complaining about this. This is what I told somebody the other day. They were complaining about their car, right? I said, what if you flip a script? What if you just completely do something out of the ordinary? What if you were just nice to your car? Go get you some soap, get you a wash rag, get you a bucket. Go out there and just begin to love on her or him. I don't know what you call your car, okay? But anyway, so you just begin to, you wash, you go, hey, baby girl, you're so good. Look at you. You're operating so well. And then you say like this, you're going to start for me, right? Instead, you get out there and you kick the tire like, why do I got to have this whole thing? And then you wonder why it don't start. Then you wonder why God don't give you a new car. If you take care of what you got, he may give you a little something more. This is what we need to do. Then the last one, this is, just, by the way, there's 11. Here's the fourth one. They were scared of giants. The Bible says that Moses, in, in, the, in the book of Numbers, uh, he said, hey, I want you to get one person from each tribe, okay, and I want you to send them over to go spy out the land of Canaan. And so they did. And when they were there, they saw the fruits. They saw the, they said a cluster of grapes was the size of a man. So figure, a, figure out a cluster of grapes was about six feet. Tall, long, hello. That's a cluster of grapes. You're getting down. That's all I'm saying. You've been eating grapes for days. Okay? And so all of a sudden when they were there, they saw the people in the land. The Bible says that the sons of Anak were there. These were the sons of the Nephilim. They were giants. Then they go on to rattle. There was the Amalekites and Jezebites and Canaanites and Serbiaites and Cellulite. I mean, there were so many ites, it was ridiculous. 
I just wanted to see if everybody was listening. That's not in the Bible, but I just thought it was funny, and I wanted to see if you were paying attention. So he said they saw all these giants, and they came back to Moses, and they just fell at his feet crying. We're going to die. God has sent us over to the promised land to kill us. Like, why did you even bring us out of Egypt? What kind of God do we serve? And then one even said, we're like grasshoppers. Like small little ants, they will squish us when we walk over here. And they were all scared, all terrified. And then Caleb got up and he said, but if God is for us, who could be against us? Let's go and kill those giants. And they all said, no. Out of 12 spies, only two, only two said we could do it. Can I just give you a quick, a quick history lesson real quick? Don't believe the hype. If God said he is for you, then he is for you. If he said it's your promised land, then it is your promised land. You need to walk in faith to see God's promises revealed. And if anybody can say that with a bold declaration, it's me. Don't believe the headlines, ladies and gentlemen. We did not lose. Don't believe that. People calling me up, Pastor, we saw your video, and it said, and we saw your video, you said you won, but all the news places said you lost. I said, that's because they didn't call me. I'd have told them. See, it's so all of a sudden we start believing these things, right? But whose report will you believe? I'll believe the report of the Lord. Amen. So we come to realize, we come to realize that uh, it would only take 14 days to leave Egypt and get to the promised land, but it would take 40 years to get to Egypt out of people. Isn't that interesting? You guys remember your salvation experience? Anybody here remember their salvation experience? Remember being up at the altar? I remember being up at the altar. I was crying. I was like, oh, my gosh, God doing something in my life. And it was good. It was sweet. It was precious, right? It was nice. And then everywhere I went after that, I saw God in everything. I mean, one time me and, me and, uh, me and Elias went to go get some food at Jack in the Box. And I remember the lady messed up on the order, and she said, hey, it's free. We said, that's the Lord. I mean, that prayer went a little extra long. Lord, bless that food. Thank you for your provision. Mm, the blessings of the Lord maketh one rich, addeth no sorrow to. I mean, we just went on. It was so good. So good. You know, you saw, you saw the Lord in everything, you know what I mean? Found, found a penny on the ground. Like, Thank you, Jesus. I'm 99 cents away from a dollar. Right? <laughs> You don't remember that? You don't remember that? It was so sweet, so innocent. But did you notice your habits didn't die so fast and easily? So I used to have a real problem cussing. I was, I, you know, my, my dad's a sailor, literally. My dad is a sailor, and my mom cusses like one. So, hi, Mom. I know you're watching. She'll tell you the truth. And so um, she'll tell you this. I didn't grow up with any rules. So my mom's philosophy was if you're going to talk like that at school, you need to talk like that in the house. So, like, from the age, I know you all looking at me like, What? Yeah, I'm not kidding. She'll tell you if she was here. So I, I, like, had a really hard time, you know, getting rid of my foul mouth. And, 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 and what was crazy is that was a hard habit to die. Here I am loving Jesus, seeing Jesus in everything, right? Like everything, like walking to class, and they're like, hey, there's no test today. That's the Lord, right? And then walking during the break and just cussing. <laughs> and so it was so bad that me and my friends had to play a little game. Every time you cuss, they get to sock you. I'd walk around, like, as one bruise. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Because, like, I was really working on killing this habit, right? And so I've come to realize that that salvation process, it was beautiful. Like, like it was instantaneous. I went from death to life. I mean, it was glorious. But that sanctification process was some hard work. Yeah, 13, 14 days to get from Egypt to the promised land. But 40 years it took to get the doubt and unbelief out of their heart. And the rebellious ways put to death. And this is an image and a picture of the people of God. Some of you have been in church 30 years and you still got that same problem. Some of you grew up in a church and you're still written with rebellion and unbelief. And so this is that process. And what happens is we've gotten used to the self-help motivational preaching and the popcorn preaching. We've gotten used to everything's a feel-good sermon. We've gotten used to getting comfortable that we're no longer disciplined or we like being disciplined. And that's why many of you are dying in the desert. Never reach it to the place where God wants you. And the only way you serve God is if it's on your terms. I've got news for you. You will die in the desert. 
because he doesn't do that, right? So here's our application. I told you it was like a buffet. I just gave you the sample platters right there. Let's get to the main course. I will carve your prime rib right here. We need to get this pandemic out of us as we are getting out of the pandemic. Well, 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 what exactly does that mean? Look at your neighbor real quickly and say, don't be like that. Look at your second choice neighbor and say, take me to lunch. Okay. <laughs> don't be like what? Don't be like the bad habits you picked up. Don't be like the bad habits we picked up. Did We go back to our first verse. It said that when unbelief and evil sets in, it will what? When you're welcome in it, it will lead you astray, right? There is, there's, uh, I, I believe it was Chuck Swindoll who first said this. He said, uh, I, I've changed the wording of, you know, lead me not into temptation is, Lord, you don't need to lead me in temptation because I know the way myself. Like, I don't need any help getting into trouble. I've kind of mastered that all on my own. And if it was left up, left up to us and there was, no, there was no people there to help us or to guide us or keep us accountable, just where would you be? What would you do? If there weren't people who you had to be accountable to, we all know how we would end up. And this is the whole point. We've picked up these bad habits along the way because we haven't had this right here to keep us, what, accountable, right? And so one of the things I just want to touch on is maybe the habitual sins are back. You know, it said that, it, it, it said that uh, pornography, uh, pornography usage went up 400% during the pandemic. And, and I would be naive to think that it didn't happen to people in the church. Is this, are, are you tracking with me? Alcohol, drug abuse, alcohol sales skyrocketed 30% during the pandemic. Drug usage. I mean, if you just look at the statistics, we know, and we can't say, well, that wasn't God's people. Well, you know it was God's people. God's people were trying to process and trying to get through this thing themselves. And so what we need to do is we need to come back together. That's the reason for women's events and men's events and all these events we're doing. This is the reason why we're coming back together so that we can deal with our demons. Some, some of you, your marriages still haven't quite rebounded. Well, guess what? We need to get it solid on the rock again. And this is the way we do it. But we first got to acknowledge that we maybe have picked up these. And by the way, the Bible's very clear on how you get rid of sin. You stop. Well, well, what do you mean? Well, you stop. That's what I mean. Let me give you a prime example. Prime example is uh, I was a youth pastor over at Valley Christian Center on Shields and Maple, and I walked into my class one day. And on my class, when I, I, I opened up my facility, and I turned on the computer, and there was pornography. I was so angry that I ripped the computer out of the wall, and I threw it off the roof. And I got in a lot of trouble. There, there, Bethany was in my youth group at that time. You could ask Bethany. It's a true story. It's a very true story. I got in a lot of trouble. They said, why did you throw the computer off the roof? I said, because you didn't put filters on the computer, and I have pornography on the computer when kids are supposed to be coming into class. How do you get rid of sin? Throw your computer off the roof. Jesus said, you'd be much better to pluck your eye out and go to, go to heaven blind than not go to heaven at all. What part of that did you not understand? I mean, I understood the whole thing. In other words, if that causes you to sin, get rid of it. Does anybody not believe me? Go back and read the words of Jesus. They're in red. He said, cut your hand off. If it causes you to sin, it's better that you go to heaven without a hand than you go to hell with both. How, how serious do you want to be? I mean, if you think you can flirt with Delilah and not sleep with her, that's up to you. But we got to be serious about it. See? See, someone's got to love you enough to give you this truth today, right? So it says to flee temptation, to stop, to run away, to get as far away from it as possible. And for the rest of it, we have Freedom Ministries, and you can come every Wednesday night and learn about it. He says, why? Hebrews, 13, Hebrews 12, 1, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I love this verse. Let us what? Let us throw off. Like, get off me, devil. Like, take this weight off me. And it says what? In everything that hinders you, how far are you willing to go to get rid of that sin? Okay, I think you get it now. All right. Next one. We got to deal with our bad church attendance. How about you make church a priority before it's an emergency? 
Should I throw that out there? Hey, listen, I realize I ain't going to win no friends. People going to text me and email me. I'm offended. You're offended anyway. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, my gosh, I can say the sky is blue. I'm offended. Okay. M maybe you're just a complainer. Nothing's ever good enough. Mad if I say this. Mad if I don't say it. Mad if I do this. Mad if I don't. Okay. Can't win. Right? But I think a lot of it. Can I, can, can I show you something in this verse that everybody quotes, but they don't quote the right way? Can you just give me a second? Can, can I show you something? Can I show you something that I can't make up but that's in your Bible and that should really be a neon sign to you? Can I can just, just one second, okay? Just one second. Watch this. We all know the first part. Don't give up meeting together, right? I think in your translation I said do not forsake the assembly of the saints, right? Right, 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 right. You, you see that? We all agree, right? Can I show you something that is in every one of your Bibles, no matter what translation? It is, it is capitalized. Can I show you? The more as you see the what? The what? Go to any Bible translation, go to anything you want to, and that word is capitalized, the day. And let me tell you why. What day do you think they're talking about? Do, by a show of hands, do you believe that Jesus is closer to returning now than he ever has been? Do you think he's going to return? Do you think he's going to return? Okay, what he's saying is if you believe that, if you believe the day is coming, if you believe the day is at hand, if you believe that Jesus could return during your lifetime, your butt needs to be in church. You need to be worshiping God. You need to be getting together with other believers. You need to be saying, listen, that day is coming. It needs to be a clarion call. Sound the trumpet in Zion and let people know the day is at hand. Go to church church. Psalms 122 says this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now we think, ah, nah, not a priority. Well, it will be when you're in an emergency. Never met a person who was in the middle of a crisis said, oh, Satan, can you help me? Never met that person. Okay. I'm almost done. We're going to have communion. Stop being selfish by not serving. You all belong to the body of Christ. You're all part. Some of you might say, well, I'm a pinky. Doesn't matter. You're part of the body. I'm a liver. Doesn't matter. You're part of the body. We have no idea what you do, but you're a liver and you're a part of the body. <laughs> Somebody said, I'm an appendix. Get out of the body. <laughs> Ask Jake. Saw this guy in pain when he, his appendix burst. He's like, get it out of me. I was like, I don't even know what it does. Right? But are you ready for this? said this last service, God just, he, he hit me with it. I'm going to let you deal with it, okay? You ready? You are not the butt of the body. You don't just get to sit there and do nothing. You're like, but I've been working on my butt. You don't understand, pastor. So <laughs> I want to make sure you're listening. Just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. You want to be like Jesus? Get a towel and a wash basin. Start washing feet. Start serving the least of these. In other words, get proactive. Last but not least before we get to our communion. Here it is. I mean, I don't know if offish is a word, but just go with me. Um, we need to be kind again. Stop being standoffish. Now, this will definitely get people to get mad at me, but it's okay. I can't wait till one day I get to burn this. It's my mask. I'm going to burn this. I'm going to go live on Facebook and just burn all like 20 of them I have. I can't wait. can't wait. Oh, my gosh, she's a COVID denier. I've already had it. I'm not denying anything. I just don't want to wear a mask no more. But can I tell you why? You, you might be thinking, well, why doesn't he want to wear a mask? Because people can't see my smile. And when I go into the store, when you're brown and you're big like this, people are always scared to grab their purses. Thank God I don't have any tattoos. <laughs> I'd have been pulled over already. Oh, he's a gang member. And, and, and what people don't get to see is this smile. Like, I'm always happy. And my wife says, well, maybe you can smile through my eyes. No, they don't. They just get tinier, and I look like I'm high. <laughs> Every picture, I have a big smile. It's like, is he high? <laughs> no, I'm not high. I want people to see that I'm kind. Like, I'm happy to be at the grocery store, and I get to buy real milk and not generic milk. Like, I'm happy. Does this make sense? I'm happy. Like, but you can't see me happy if I'm like this. Does this make sense? 
And so what I think people have been hiding behind this mask, and it's really revealed what's been in their heart. They're not kind. They're mean people. And so now they got an excuse to be mean because you can't see them and you can't hold them accountable. But when we get rid of that, people will start to be kind again. They'll open the door for you. They'll say please. They'll say thank you. They'll let you in and not cut you off. Hello, we can be kind again. Why? Because the Bible commands it. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit who is within you. It's divine. It's love carried out in various expressions. It's joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that endures, kindness in action, a life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart, and strength of spirit. This is a command to God's people. This is our command that this is how we get to walk out our Christian life. And it costs us nothing to forgive, to love, to be kind, to have faith, to practice patience. This is how we do it. By who? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So here it is. Don't be like that, the children in the desert. I want you to be like this, the fruit of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen? So. So, go ahead and stand to your feet. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to leave you with this thought as uh, they're going to prepare communion for you. Love communion. God's promises. God's got a promise for everybody. God's promises, right? They're on the other end of your faithfulness to Him. Let me explain. You cannot violate the commands of God and expect to receive the blessings of God. Well, what do you mean, Pastor? That means I can't eat whatever I want and expect to lose weight. I've tried. It didn't work. It didn't work at all. The opposite happened. So God's blessings are on the other end of the, God's promises are on the other end of your obedience, and that's the blessings. This is the time to get disciplined again. This is the time for us to remember that. We don't want to be like that. We want to be like this. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you for everything you're doing here and now. Holy Spirit of God, we submit and surrender to you, Lord, as we offer our worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen.